We leven in ons beeldscherm. We zijn altijd bereikbaar. Onze eigen tijd is schaars. Waar is dat moment voor onszelf gebleven? Time takes a cigarette. In tegenlichtlab geven we de studio dit keer aan de beroemde Amerikaanse mediatheoreticus Douglas Rushkoff. Hij schreef het boek Present Shock, waarin hij analyseert hoe en door wie onze tijd gekoloniseerd wordt. Hoe digitale ontwikkelingen ons leven hebben overgenomen. Hij houdt een pleidooi voor de herovering van het nu. Ons nu. Dit is wat u te wachten staat. These technologies are here to keep the dying marketplace alive, right? To keep the Nasdaq stock exchange going. You're sitting behind a computer screen, you're shooting missiles at enemy targets, you're killing enemy combatants. And then at the end of the day, you get back in your car and 20 minutes later, you're at the dinner table talking to your kids about their homework. If you were trying to engage in a meaningful conversation with your spouse through text, that might not be the right tool for the job. You know, unless you don't really want to have that conversation with your spouse. And then you've got to look at that. Dit is Tegenlicht. Welkom in uw eigen tijd. Rushkoff. off. Take one. Mark. So I got the idea for present shock originally when I was watching this really trashy American television show called The Real Housewives of Orange Tell County. Me, Let like me you show you a little of it. These fights. It's not always me. Vicky fights with everybody. Vicky and Gretchen fight all the time. See, this is a show, it's supposed to be a reality show about these wealthy American housewives. But what it's, actually all that happens is these women, they go to dinner together and they have misunderstandings and they fight. And this is all that happens. And I tend to watch television, I'm a media theorist, so I watch television from the perspective of a media theorist and I have to ask, what's the nature of the communications breakdown between these people? They, they're the same socioeconomic status, the same gender, they speak the same language, and, and why do they have so many disagreements? And then eventually it occurred to me that the reason why this is happening is because I mean, look at their faces, that these women have had you know, so much plastic surgery you know, and so much Botox put into their faces that they can't make facial expressions that are appropriate to the situations that they're in. You know, one of them might say, you know, oh, uh, you know, my daughter's just going in for cancer testing. And the other one with her locked in face will say, Oh, you know, I'm so sorry to hear that. It's very sad. And the first one will say, oh, you're, what are you thinking? You're, you're lying to me. You know, and it's because her face can't register the expression that she's trying to make. And the other one picks up on this uh, uh, you know, seeming inconsistency. And what I realized was the problem here was that these women, you know, because of all of this technology they now have, between this, the surgery and the Botox and the collagen and the Gore-Tex implants that they could put, They're trying to use technology to lock their faces at age 29, right? To lock the moment of age 29. And in doing so, they make themselves inaccessible to the moment they're actually living, right? So they, they lock down a certain kind of time, but they lose access to the real time in which a human being actually lives. And the Greeks actually understood this. The Greeks had two words for this two words for time. You know, one was chronos, which is time of the clock, like age 29. You know, what time did you crash the car? Oh, I crashed the car at 4.01 p.m., right? It's, it's an exact time, time of the clock. You know, the other kind of time that the Greeks had was something they called kairos. You know, and kairos isn't time of the clock. It's not time with a number. It's more time as human timing or time as, as a sense of readiness. You know, we crashed the car at 4.01, but what time do you tell your father you crashed the car? Right, 4.23, 4.17, you know, it doesn't matter. You know, you know if you're a smart kid, you tell your dad you crashed the car, you know, after he's had his drink, but before he's opened the bills, right? Because that's the sweet spot when he's still a little, a little buzzed, but not yet upset. You know, what, what these women are suffering and what I think we're suffering from as a whole is this kind of addiction to chronos, you know, to 
the time that's on the clock to the kind of number time that is so amplified by digital technology, by almost any technology. It gives us ways to really refine that, to get closer and closer in on that exact thing, or for them to simulate what their faces look like at that, at that exact moment. But it makes, uh, it makes the real time at which life is passing you know, less and less accessible to us. It's part of what happens to us you know, as a society, really, and as people, as we move from the, the analog industrial age society into this new, very digital one. I mean, if you look, if you look at these clocks, it's what it reminds me of is when, when I was a little kid, I had a, uh, I had an analog alarm clock that my father gave me. And it was actually, I think, his father's. It was a super old electric alarm clock. And it, was, it had a, a sweep second hand that moved around the clock face. Like, it wasn't even like this. This is kind of a digital analog clock, right? It's going click, 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 click. This old electric clock, it just, the, the hand moved smoothly around the dial. And I remember as I would go to sleep at night, you know, it would be you know, 9.02 at night. And I would, Watch the, watch the second hand go around, and I would say, oh, it's getting closer and closer to 903, closer and closer, closer, until finally it's like that moment of climax, it hits the 12 minutes, oh, now we're at 903, it's a new minute, it's this new fresh minute, and I experienced each act of this, this, so here's the first act, is that first quarter, and then the next act, now we're halfway through, then it's kind of an older minute, and I moved around like that, you know, until I fell asleep. I watched that sort of continuous drama of, of the minutes passing. You know, and I had a, a, a kind of a holistic understanding of what time was. Time was this, this narrative, this sweep, this story. You know, and then one night, I went in. My dad had changed my alarm clock. He had gotten, I think, as a gift from one of his business associates, he had gotten a, you know, a little digital alarm clock, and it wasn't the kind people have today. It was this old kind, like this, with, with the, little, the little numbers that flap down. You know, that you can see they just flap each minute. So all of a sudden, you know, I'm sitting there at night, and it would be, you know, uh, uh, I can't even make it do that now. Say it was, it was you know, 9.05. It's not like the beginning of 9.05, or the middle of 9.05, or the end of 9.05. It's just 9.05. So I sit there, I'm staring at this thing, and it's like it's not moving, right? It's just frozen in time. It's just sitting there, 9.05, 9.05, 9.05, until bam, 9.06. All of a sudden, okay, now, all right, 9.06, okay, 9.06, 9.06, 9.06, 9.06. .06. So each minute, instead of being this, mm, oh, we're here, now we're going around, it's just frozen, right? Frozen like the faces of those women on the, on the TV show. It's just stuck. We're, we're just stuck in this thing until bam, 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 bam. So for me, I moved from something that felt, even though this is chronos, at least it's continuous, at least it's moving through time the way I do, we moved into this kind of digital time, which really even, it, it accentuates the, the chronos character of it even more. It, it's sequential. So we're not moving through time. We're moving from minute to minute to minute to minute. And that's the way digital technology feels really as a whole. It's this series of choices that we make. You know, we, we, you, you do this or you do that. You click on this or you click on that. You know, the digital technology turns everything into sequences. And it's not a matter of it being better or worse. It's just a matter of it being different. It moves like a computer program. You know, but what did we do? You know, well, what, what, we, what we ultimately did was because we wanted to make more money with this, because we wanted to increase our, uh, uh, the surface area of human attention, because we wanted to keep people in a, a constant state of internet usage and consumption, you know, we take the internet, we put it in a phone, and we strap the phone to our body or keep it in our pocket and have it you know, vibrate us every time somebody does a, a Facebook update or a tweet about us or sends us an SMS or has an email or the, the AP or BBC news feed thinks there's a sports score that we care about. So we have this thing vibrate us and we live in this, uh, this always on reality, the, the state of, of perpetual emergency interruption where it's saying, pay attention to me, pay attention to me, something's happening, there's an emergency, you've got to look, you've got to come. You know, so rather than, than adapting to the asynchronous 
bias. And using that, we try to turn it into something that imitates the always-on quality of real life. And we end up living in this state of perpetual emergency interruption. You know, this is a, a, a frame of mind, a state of being that was really only endured by, uh, you know, telephone emergency operators or air traffic controllers. And even they only did it two or three hours at a time, and they took medication in order to live according to that. And now, you know, we live in a world where, where everybody is in this, is in this uh, uh, always on state. this state where they're kind of just glued glued to their devices in a way I mean where are they you know this woman's not in the street right he's not he's not where he is he's somewhere else no it's not necessarily bad to be somewhere that you don't want to be but don't they want to be somewhere in this job, I see the people uh, in almost... This guy's funny, right? He's the only one who's noticing what's going on. He's like, he's trying to raise money for the disabled in this little gecko suit. But it's a great opportunity for him to just look at the world, you know? Because he's the only one trying to make physical contact with anybody else. You see people, it's like, welcome to La La Land. Because everybody's tapping away for different things. And nobody's talking to anybody. So I don't think that's a good idea. Right. And La La Land, honestly, I, I believe it's less a function of the technology itself than how we've employed it. You know, we're employing the technology in order to promote the agenda of the marketplace. You know, these technologies are not here right now to help us be more human, to help us reconnect with one another. These technologies are here to keep the dying marketplace alive, right? <laughs> to keep the NASDAQ stock exchange going, not to keep um, you and me in in uh, in connection with one another. Now, and in I what way? In what way? And how are they doing mm -hmm. that? Well, they're doing that by trying to mediate every interaction that we have. In other words, me talking to someone else doesn't make anyone money. Me talking to someone else through a cell phone does make someone money. You know, not just because I'm paying for the the time to be online, but now because the conversation itself is tracked and becomes part of a big data search engine, which is then used to figure out you know, what to advertise to me in my, uh, uh, in my future. But really, what, that, what we're looking at is that in combination with this moment of history has kind of put us at, at, at an interesting turning point. You know, the, the great futurist Alvin Toffler you know, wrote a book in the very early 70s called Future Shock. And what he was looking at is uh, the way that we were all, uh, change was changing so fast, change was happening so fast that most people felt like immigrants in the present. You know, they, 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 there was so much unfamiliar stuff. It just change was accelerating and accelerating. And I feel like, you know, as we move towards the end of the 20th century, we were moving towards change and change. Everybody was leaning forward. But then we got to the year 2000 and we were no longer leaning forward, right? We weren't in the 90s. We weren't partying like it's 1999. All of a sudden we went from being futurists, thinking about the future, to being kind of presentists wondering about the now. And just as that happened, you know, interestingly enough, just as that was happening, we got, we got you know, 9-11, which, uh, uh, you know, kind of further uh, broke down that sense of narrative, that sense of leaning forward, that sense of infinite possibility was all of a sudden, oh, wait a minute. It was like the story was broken. So there was that combined with the impact of digital technology on narrative. The beginning of our digital empowerment over storytelling, over uh, especially coercive market-based storytelling was the remote control. You know, the second great device, you know, was this. Remember this? The Nintendo joystick. The joystick, most of us of my generation remember the place we were the first time we ever saw a video game. You know, and it was probably the, the video game Pong. Remember, with Pong was just, you know, two white squares on either side of the screen. They'd go up and there would be this little dot that you would, you know, boop, 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 and you'd, you'd go back and forth with it. 
I can move something on the screen. It was the liberation of the pixel. You know, just as the, as the remote control deconstructed the content of television, the joystick demystified the medium. It demystified the pixel. You know, and then finally, you know, with the, com the computer mouse and the keyboard, now we could not only change what's happening on the screen, but now, the, now we could express ourselves through the screen. So now the content on the monitor could as easily be content that I created as content that someone else did. So we, we went from a, a, a read-only medium, a receive-only medium of television, a continuous storytelling medium, into this very uh, you know, deconstructed, demystified, DIY, do-it-yourself medium and at the same time, we have these devices that stop narrativity and turn us into a much more, uh, a, a much less narrative society. You know, and and a lot of people, and they they even think when I when I say this, they think I'm saying that this is something bad. Oh no, the story is gone. Our collective myth. Oh poor Joseph Campbell and the hero's journey. And oh, what's humanity going to do? What are our goals? I'm like. Personally, I'm thank God this finally happened. You know, look what was the 20th century if not a bunch of charismatic guys saying, I have this dream, I have this goal, and then everybody follow me, keep your eyes on the prize on this ends justifies the means journey towards my vision of the future. Sometimes, you know, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, those were good. Most of the times, Stalin, Hitler, everybody else, they were really bad, right? Because what was he, what were these people doing? They were saying, keep your focus on this fictional moment in the future, keep your blinders on, and ignore the bloodshed of right now. You know, that's what capitalism says. It's what communism says. It's what they all say on one level is ignore now for the future reward. It's what Christianity says. So you're suffering now, but You'll get it in the afterlife. And, and those don't work anymore. That whole way of organizing people narratively towards these artificial futures. You know, and we're dealing with it. But, but the, the positive that comes out of that, and I know they look naive, but the, for me, the positive that comes out of that are things like, um, like Occupy. You know, what was Occupy but a non-narrative, non-goal-oriented version of politics. I mean, look at this interview with this occupier. Well, I don't know. It's really difficult to kind of answer questions leading to those conclusions. I'd say that we didn't take our cue of anybody, really. It became a more spontaneous movement. As far as seeing this end, I wouldn't like to see it end. I'd like to see the conversation continue. See, that's really insane. I mean, everybody's going around to these guys saying, you know, what are your demands? Well, we're not demanding something. We're doing something. Well, what is your goal? Well, we don't like to talk about it in terms of goals. Well, where do you see this thing ending? Well, I don't really see it ending. I see this as something that continues. So, you know, CNN or Fox News or any regular station that makes their money on what, in 15 seconds, tell me what this is about. They don't have a way to express what this is about. So all they can do is take pictures of the silliest looking people and say, oh, this is nothing. Or they can say, well, if you can't express yourself in terms of a goal, then you don't exist. Right? But what Occupy was trying to say was, no, it's not about what our goal is. It's about our actual, our process. It's about our method. What we are trying to do is to, is to develop a new prototype of human interaction that's based less on you know, parliamentary debate, which is about a game with a winner and a loser. Right? You have a debate with two different sides. They're going to fight until someone wins, and then it's over. Half the people are happy. Half the people are unhappy, but we move on, to move from that to much more of a, a, a model of consensus building. We are all going to sit here and talk this out and figure out how to come up with something that actually satisfies the greatest number of people and uh, makes the people who are unsatisfied the least unhappy.
know, we have a marketplace where money kind of has a built-in clock, where venture capital uh, needs to grow. The stock market's something that has to expand. Your shares have to increase in value over time. So a bunch of people going, oh, we're going to sit in this park and talk about politics, or I'm going to start having these experiences that are less about winning, that are less about expansion. This is not good. Right, this is this is not good. It's not good as far as the market's concerned. You know, so there were people, and you know, I saw it as very much the sort of the Wired magazine generation that had a very different view of what technology was for and how it could be used. You know, Wired saw technology as digital technology in particular as the salvation for the dying stock exchange. You know, so it became this kind of uh, the poster child for the new economy. And the idea was, you know, yes, the, the real estate online in a digital environment is infinite. There's essentially an infinite number of websites and media and things that you can post there. But there's still a market we can make. And that market is going to be in human attention. You know, so Wired Magazine had a cover story about the attention economy. It wasn't their term, but they kind of revived it, the idea that even though the, we have infinite online real estate, we only have so many eyeball hours, right? There's only so many human beings and so many hours that they can spend glued to technology. So what we have to do is mine that for value. So instead of going to, to Africa and South America and finding those countries and enslaving those people and digging their resources out of the ground, right? that's not working anymore. Those people are fighting back. They're having revolutions. We can't, colonialism is dead, but we can still colonize human attention. We can still colonize and garner strength from these, you know, from these eyeball hours. You know, and that's when we start to see all of a sudden Kids who refuse to pay attention, kids who are using the remote control, you know, now, oh, well, that's not empowerment. That's not them redirecting their attention and taking charge of the narrative. That's a disease, right? So we start saying all these kids have attention deficit disorder. And we start, it's funny, one of my, one of my students actually gave me this because she quit. But um, we started giving them Ritalin. You know, Ritalin prescriptions in America went up by about 4,000%, at least last time I checked, since Wired Magazine's cover that we're living in an attention economy. And is that coincidence? I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of things we, could, we can say are causing uh, attention deficit disorder and the, 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 the massive, you know, seeming epidemic or outbreak of, of spectrum disorders, but I can't help but see a lot of them as an adaptive response to a world where the, the you know, Wired Magazine's followers are employing every trick they can, every piece of technology they can, to get these devices to be more attractive to us than other people, to get the smartest sound engineer out of Stanford to create a, a you've got male tone that hits you in all the right emotional places to create that Pavlovian response. So I got to see if I got more mail. I got to see that interface of, oh, I can pull this down and see my tweets. Oh, there's new tweets. Mm, 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 mm. I mean, they're studying that. This is not conspiracy theory. This is science. This is called captology. BJ Fogg at Stanford. That's what they study. That's the kids that aren't being paid to do one thing are being paid you know, to do that. The market is trying to colonize and exploit your time and take it away from your loving, from your fucking, from your children, from your breathing, from your playing, and turn you into something else. You know, so everywhere I look where people are trying to maintain these multiple identities in this fractious way, in this digiphrenic way, they end up screwed up. is a complete cultural change for the Air Force. Pretty soon we will have more unmanned than manned aircraft. It's almost surreal. Come down to the so you have these guys, they're in Nevada, right? Their real bodies are in Nevada, in the United States, outside Los Angeles. The planes they're flying are like out in Afghanistan and Iraq. Two. All right, looks like we're by ourselves out here. 63 Bravo High, uh, W6. This isn't a video game. This is a real airplane flying through real airspace. You need to be able to think through a three-dimensional problem that's located 7,500 miles away from you. Room, ten hood. The biggest risk that we accept is that, that detachment from it. 
real live weapons, doing a real mission. I try to ensure that people understand there are people who are counting on us to do the mission. See, now the fear of these people, you know, is that, oh, because we're disconnected from uh, uh, the reality of what we're doing, you know, that we're going to be uh, heartless. You know, that, oh, this is long distance and it's in VR, so we could just blow up people like a video game and not feel anything about it. You know, the irony of it is that these people end up with higher rates of post-traumatic stress disorder than people who are actual fighter pilots. Five, four, three, two, one. Good splash. You're sitting behind a computer screen, you're shooting missiles at enemy targets, you're killing enemy combatants, and then at the end of the day, you get back in your car, and 20 minutes later, you're at the dinner table talking to your kids about their homework. Hey, guys. Daddy. Hi. I mean, they know I, I fly UAVs, but I don't necessarily go home and tell them that, you know, what mission I flew or something like that. How was your day, buddy? Um, good. Yeah, that's a challenge in the job that you've got to do that day in and day out. Right now, that's a pure, that's the purest de definition of digifrenia I can almost experience. This person, this guy lives in two places at once. You know, Daddy, what did I do in preschool today? You know, instead of going to war, now he's at war and at home. He's killing and with family. and. Those don't compute. <laughs> no, they don't. They don't actually. Um, they don't come together in a reasonable in a reasonable way. You know, and that's um, to me one of the profound challenges of living in uh, in this presentist, highly digital age. You know, we we foresaw some of this. You know, back in the 20th century, we got you know up here. We got you know Guernica, which is a great. Um, it's a great way of understanding the 20th century. The 20th century was Cubism. You know, it's, it's a perfect art form for the era in which we were thinking about kind of looking at the same thing from multiple perspectives at the same time. Right? That's what Cubism did. And that's why everyone was shocked. Oh, we can see the same thing from multiple perspectives in the same moment. Right? This is all different things, but at the same moment. Right? And he sort of mashed them into the same thing. You know, today, the, 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 the 21st century equivalent of cubism is the mashup. But instead of seeing you know, the same thing from multiple perspectives at the same time, we're seeing multiple times mashed into the same perspective. I mean, so the idea here is you can take, uh, uh, because of the, the recombinant cut and paste quality of uh, uh, a, a digital, not just digital culture, but digital recording or digital society, you can take all these different times and smush them into the same place. You know, what does that do to time, right? It obliterates what we think of as time, in literal time or linear time, and creates this uh, uh, not wrong, not bad, but a very artificial kind of a time. It's a, it's a, a synthetic time. But this is people really trying to take charge of the sensibility that the drone pilot is suffering from. On the bright side, what that means is we can disconnect from the, for the most part, false narrative about our civilization, our society. Oh, the great journey that we've been on as a people and our nation and our conquest of all these others. And we can start to realize that real time has almost nothing to do with that kind of historic journey and has everything to do with the moment that you're in, that, you're, that we're living in a real time in which you can reinvent yourself at any moment. You know, there's a, a, there's a Talmudic law um, that you're not allowed to remind somebody of who they were. Like, I'm not allowed to go to you and say, oh, I remember when you were a little greedy kid and when you did that thing. Because 
not just because it's embarrassing and mean to tell someone about their past, but because it, at least in my interpretation, but because it negates their right, it negates their privilege of reinventing who they are. Say, no, you know, yeah, I did that shitty stuff, but now I am this person. And you've got to accept me as me now, not as me the screwball. You know, and likewise, you know, it seems, you know, as long as we're talking about big data and all that, um, you're, you're, you're not allowed to use somebody's past to predict their future either. I don't think it's fair for me to live in an online universe that has been configured based on their estimation of my future. They're not allowed to get to my future before I'm there. Even if they know I'm going to be gay, that I'm going to get married, that I'm going to get divorced, that I'm going to go on a diet, even if they know that highly, the high probability of that future, they're not allowed to deliver that future to me until I'm there. Because until I'm there, there were other possibilities. You know, but if they start marketing all that stuff to me, I'm much more likely to go down one of those rabbit holes rather than be the unique, alive, anomalous person. You know, what keeps society alive and strange and unpredictable are those people that choose that other 10%, that choose that path less chosen, right? The path less taken. So I think that the, the danger here you know, if we, if we don't celebrate it, if we don't celebrate the autonomy associated with it, is that we end up going down um, the more predictable path, you know, that we become more and more uh, machine-like. You know, and that's, I guess, is my biggest fear, you know, is that, you know, when I talk to my peers, you know, my other uh, whatever we are, digerati, techno theory people, right? These guys are all into this idea of the singularity. You know, that I, the moment that computers become smarter and more thinking than humans, and they think it's inevitable. You know, and they have this theory of reality, which is that information is evolving towards greater states of complexity. And as long as we're the most complex thing, that's fine. But as soon as computers are more complex than people, then information will use computers to get even more complex. And then people, humans, we're only important in so far as we can keep the computers going. You know, otherwise, it doesn't matter. You know, and I argue, I say, no, that doesn't, that doesn't make sense to me. You know, th th this has the medium and the message reversed. You know, human beings aren't here to serve information. Information is here, is, is, is here to, as a byproduct of our meaning, of us giving it meaning. Information doesn't even exist without human beings to relate to it, to understand it. Otherwise, it's not information. It's just bleh. You know, what's the sound of a fax machine without the paper on the other end? It's just ksh. It's not information, I promise you. You know, so I believe that human beings have this special place in the universe, that we are special, and that, no, we've got to fight for, for our place in this thing. It's not about surrendering our agency to machines. So how, how and they can say we do to me, that? Well, what they say to me, though, is, uh, uh, well, you just say that because you're a human, that it's hubris. I'm saying, I mean, damn straight I say it because I'm on Team Human. Yeah, what, do you want me to be on Team Machine? Of course I'm on Team Human, you know? And you don't need to go into movies like Terminator to be there. Yes, I'm on Team Human. You know, but the, the, the irony is that in, in popular culture even, you know, we seem to be obsessed with this confusion between humans and machines. It's not just all these movies about, you know, that, that, that we enslave computers and robots and then the Cylons and various machines come back to get us. You know, it's even in, uh, in zombie movies. I mean, I got this, this great clip here from, you know, Walking Dead, uh, uh, an American uh, zombie show. And, uh, you know, the, the beauty of these shows is they're not just Nightmare scenarios. I mean, listen to the music even. You know, these shows are, they're doing two things. On the one hand, they're asking that basic question on what's the difference between me and that zombie, right? We both gotta eat, you know, we both have to kill in order to survive. Maybe humans are no different from zombies. And if we are no different from zombies, then yeah, then the techno guys are right. 
then we might as well let the computers go because we're dead. We're just walking dead. You know, the other interesting thing is these movies and TV shows about zombie apocalyptic futures are in some ways utopian wish fulfillment. For those of us who are so inundated with our faxes and messages and this and that, the zombie world actually sounds kind of good. You just sit on a mountaintop, you know, or with your family and a shotgun and look for slow moving zombies on the horizon and blow them away. I mean, your phone's not going to ring, your boss isn't going to bother you, there's no taxes to pay, no cop, there's nothing, there's just zombies. And on some level, it's like people would almost rather reset to that reality then have to push forward. It's easier for people to imagine a zombie apocalypse than it is for them to imagine next year. You know, the next year is almost more frightening than this. So, you know, that's sort of how, how society reacts. You know, how can we counter this? I mean, how can we get out? My, my uh, uh, easiest path to get out of this is to remember that reality is our home turf. You know, the actual flesh and blood reality in which we live. You know, the internet is a beautiful thing, right? It's a cool thing and these spaces are great, but on the internet, we don't have home field advantage anymore. When we're on the internet, you're on the stock market, the algorithms have home field advantage. Right? You're, you're, uh, you're on, a, uh, on a, a website or on Facebook, the corporations have home field advantage. The only place where you have home field advantage is here in this place that we evolved, where we've got that 93% of human communication that the Botox women have lost their, their access to. The 93% of communication that happens non-verbally as your irises get bigger, or small, or you nod or shake your head or you breathe simpatico in rapport or you, Sit back. All that is the place where we actually find our power. You know, what is a conspiracy? What does that mean? What does that word even come from? From Socrates, conspiring with other people. Conspire means to breathe together. You know, that's what a conspiracy is. It doesn't happen online. A conspiracy, and I mean it in the good way, is people breathing together actually have power. You know, so one is to reconnect with other people in the real world. The other is to reclaim the, the biological, natural clocks that actually run your system. What we're just discovering now is that in the 28-day lunar cycle, more things happen than a woman's menstruation. You know, we're all, we've all been living with the moon for a long time, and it's one of the ways our bodies actually reset some really profoundly powerful clocks. So what we're finding is that in the, in the four-week lunar cycle, in the first week of a lunar cycle, we tend to be dominated by acetylcholine. Right, acetylcholine is a particular neurotransmitter that kind of makes you peppy and energetic and open to new ideas and friendly and childlike. In the second week, we're dominated by serotonin, which is great for working and, and, and getting through things and giving you great endurance. You know, in the third week, we're dominated by dopamine. You know, dopamine, that's not going to be a week when you're going to get work done, right? Dopamine is a party drug. It's the, it's, the, it's the time to have fun with other people. You go drinking, relax, look at the work you've had, eat. You know, in the last week of a, of a, of a lunar cycle, you're dominated by norepinephrine, which is kind of a fight or flight response. So it's when you're going to be in a cold kind of calculating state. It's great to do structural analysis, you know, organize your portfolio, uh, decide on the chapters of your book, restructure your organization, you know, but don't try to forge a new relationship right then. You know, that's when you're going to be kind of cool and collected. You know, if you understood things like this, if we did as individuals, we can start to schedule our, our lives in a way that kind of conforms to our biological reality rather than continually trying to twist our biological reality or drug it, you know, in order to conform to something else. It's like, oh, I'm in a bad mood. I better take some of this drug. It's like, no, you're not in a bad mood. You're just not in the right mood for that. You know, it's people uh, really not trusting who they are and where they are and when they are. You know, so what I'm trying to do is to help people reclaim the present, you know, reclaim Kairos, kind of trust the moment they're in. And the way to get in that moment is breathe, 
you know, just be in touch with your breath. In every breath, you have that four-part rhythm. To a lot of people, it's, this sounds too new age, I think. But, uh, tough, yeah. you know, tough. You know, and as long as the marketplace can make being a human being uncool, they're going to win. How can we reclaim ourselves if we are glued to the screen all the time? You can't reclaim yourself if you're glued to the screen all the time because you're glued to the screen all the time. I mean, you've got to understand that the bias of digital technology is towards choice, right? Giving you more choice. You know, the screen will try to do it by, do you want this or that? Do you want to click on this thing or that thing? But the other choice you also have in this on, off, yes, no universe is screen or not screen. Right? Use my device or not use my device. Do I want to text my answer to you or do I want to say my answer to you? If you are trying to watch your movies on your cell phone, that might not be the right tool for the job. If you are trying to engage in a meaningful conversation with your spouse through text, that might not be the right tool for the job. You know, unless you don't really want to have that conversation with your spouse. And then you've got to look at that. You know, if you understand digital environments, if you're sort of digitally literate, um, you start to see behind the curtain. You start to see how this works. And best of all, you become capable of programming it to your ends rather than just using it to someone else's. You know, you're driving the car. You know, most people think that learning to program is sort of like becoming an auto mechanic. They'll say, look, I can drive my car and I don't have to know how to fix it. I'm not talking about the difference between an auto mechanic and a driver. I'm talking about the difference between a driver and a passenger. Now, if you're going to live in an automotive culture, are you content with being a passenger? I mean, maybe, but what if you're a passenger in a car where everything's blacked out and you can't even look out the windows? You've got to now trust the driver to take you where he's saying is the best place, to the best supermarket, to your friend's house. Oh, your friend's house isn't there anymore. What do you mean it's not there? It's just not there. We're only going to, I'll take you to this other friend. It's, closer and, and we can't. Do you trust your driver? Maybe if I'm, you know, Miss Daisy or somebody in that movie, I trust Morgan Freeman. He seemed nice. But I don't trust Mark Zuckerberg to drive me. I don't trust Twitter to drive me. I don't trust these companies because they're not there to drive me. As I've been saying the whole time, they're there to increase their shareholder value in the short term. They're there to make billions of dollars off my attention. They're not there to create more human connections for me, because the more human connections I have, the less time I'm spending in their worlds. But are you optimistic still? Well, I don't even know what that would mean anymore. I have hope. I have hope. No, I'm not optimistic. You know, all I can do is say, how can I make my behavior now more consonant with the way in which uh, I think things actually are, you know? And the more optimistic I get, the kind of the more utopian and the more I start reaching for a vision of the future that I want to realize rather than an experience of the present that I want to, I want to manifest. So I'm kind of trying to occupy reality in that sense, you know, not just Wall Street, but to say, no, I'm actually going to be here now, as Ram Dass told us. And, uh, uh, the things I'm going to work on are the, the obstacles to that. What's preventing me from, ex from being here now? And, and, you know, and, and work that way with it. OK, great. Thanks. You want to hug me? Yeah, let's hug. Are you allowed yeah, to be on camera? Just, <laughs> are you allowed to be yeah, on? It's, you, it's should, really, you should have him on. Have him. Get out of the, out been, of the digital realm. He's been here the whole time. <laughs> the whole time. He's real, he's it's, human. It's real. It's, it's human. real. It's gonna be real now. Thank you for watching. For more on this subject, take a look at the playlist. You can also watch this recommended video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and we'll keep you updated on our documentaries.